Let me uh, echo Tom's welcome and uh, tell you that we're looking forward to a very lively discussion. hope to get you involved. Uh, the way this is going to work, just to uh, sort of give you an outline. Uh, uh, well, actually, before I do that, I want to say what an honor it is to be back at the SIBO Scholars. Uh, some of you may recall that I had the privilege of moderating last year's event in Washington and Virginia on synthetic biology. And like last year's event, we have really exceptional people here to talk about something that's really become a part of the election and a part of uh, the fabric of American civilization now, the ongoing debate about what we're calling class warfare. Uh, I know that all of you were enjoying to read Charles Murray as well as uh, the Communist Manifesto, and I hope that I will bring you into this discussion after the break uh, when we will talk some more. We'll hear from each participant, and then we'll get a full-fledged discussion going, and we'll have interactivity after the break. Uh, also, it's an honor to be with you. I mean, I hope all of you um, are well aware and mindful of the fact that this is an extraordinary honor that's been bestowed upon you, and a, a great... Uh, in many ways, responsibility that goes with being a SIBO scholar. Uh, you are the best and the brightest in many respects, and I keep telling people that this is a particularly important event for me to be involved in because of the fact that you have been really, uh, you represent the most exceptional and best promise of America. So I welcome you and tell you what an honor it is to be uh, with you here once again. I uh, want to also extend thanks to Tom Siebel and his uh, extraordinary staff for putting on this weekend and for all that they've done to make this really a terrific and memorable weekend. The real question for us initially is, um, well, how unequal are we and how do we get to this place of inequality? And then later on this uh, morning, we're going to have, in the afternoon, excuse me, another panel where we're going to take up the question, where do we go? And I hope that will be not only lively and exciting like this I expect to be, but will also involve interactivity. Let me tell you what a privilege it is to be with this distinguished panel as well, and let me tell you who they are. Um, immediately to my right is, uh, this has nothing to do with political affiliations, um, uh, is David Brooks, who is certainly familiar to many of you who read the New York Times. He is uh, the op-ed uh, columnist in the New York Times and certainly well known for his work, not only as an editorial writer for the New York Times, but also as an author. He's been senior editor at Weekly Standard, a contributing editor at Newsweek and the Atlantic Monthly, and many of you know him from the world of public radio, which is my world as well. He's a commentator on the uh, News Hour with Jim Lair. Uh, to name some of his books, Bobos in Paradise, The New Upper Class, and How They Got There, and On Paradise Drive, How We Live Now and Always Have in the Future Tense. Both were published by Simon & Schuster, and his third book was The Social Animal, The Hidden Sources of Love, Character, and Achievement, which was published by Random House. Uh, he was also op editor at the Wall Street Journal, and when with the Wall Street Journal was posted in Brussels, covered Russia, the Middle East, South Africa, and European affairs. And please give a Siebel Scholar welcome to David Brooks. We also have Bill Galston with us, who presently holds the Ezra Zika Chair at the Brookings Institution's Governance Studies Program. He serves there as Senior Fellow. He's at also College Park Professor at the University of Maryland and Founding Director of the Center of Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement. That's called CIRCLE, of course, and Executive Director of the National Commission on Civic Renewal, the author of eight books of 100 articles in the field of political theory, public policy, and American politics. Let's give a plug for his most recent book. It's Liberal Pluralism, published by Cambridge, and the Practice of Liberal Pluralism. He also is the author of Public Matters and won American Political Science Association's Hubert Humphrey Award uh, and is a frequent commentator on NPR, another NPR person, uh, and writes a weekly column, Vital Center, for the online edition of The New Republic. Uh, another distinguished guest who we're glad to have on the panel with us. Please give a warm Siebel Scholar welcome for Bill Galston. <laughs> Charles Murray, whom you've read uh, and discussed, I know, in the Siebel Scholar Book Club, is a political scientist, an author, a well-known libertarian, uh, came to national attention when he published a book called Losing Ground, and has been credited, really, with providing the intellectual foundation for the welfare reform of 1996. Also author of the New York Times bestseller, Controversial Bell Curve, and co-authored with the late Richard Hernstein, um, that book. And his most recent book, which I guess you did discuss, is Coming Apart, 
uh, unprecedented divergent in American classes over the half century. And I want to thank uh, Charles Murray, who has agreed to be the first speaker here when we begin uh, brief uh, two to five minute presentations by each of the panelists. Uh, Charles has also been uh, a scholar with the American Enterprise Institute and prior to that was a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research and a research scientist at the American Institute for Research. You have quite a lot of bona fides we have here. Please welcome Charles Murray. <laughs> and uh, finally, in this particular panel, we want to welcome Bob Reich. Robert Reich has served in three national administrations. Most recently, Secretary of Labor under President Bill Clinton, also served on President-elect at the time Barack Obama's Transition Advisory Board. He has written 13 books. His most recent best-selling book, well, we don't know how we measure this. It's an e-book, but it's called Beyond Outrage. Uh, and he's co-founding editor of the American Prospect Magazine, chairman of Common Cause. Commentaries can be heard weekly on Public Radio's Marketplace. And in 2003, uh, Robert Reich was awarded the prestigious Vassal Havel Vision Foundation Prize by former Czech President Vassal Havel for pioneering work in economic and social thought. In 2008, Time Magazine named him one of the 10 most successful cabinet secretaries of the century. A welcome for Bob Reich. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you once again for all of you being here and for the panelists being here and Charles Murray and he's going to be on both panels today, and with uh, respect for that role as well, let's have you begin. Sure. Since you've all read the book from cover to cover, and I'm sure studied uh, the, the uh, appendices as well, I really don't need to say anything. Uh, but I will just recap. Uh, Coming Apart argues that there has been an unprecedented divergence in classes in the United States over the last 50 years. That at the bottom there has been the formation of a new lower class, uh, that is distinguished from former lower classes, first by its size, but mainly by the degree to which it no longer participates in some of the essential aspects of America's civic culture. The paradigmatic example of that uh, is marriage, whereby among whites ages 30 to 49 in the working class, whereas 84% of them were married in 1960, uh, they are now 48% married. That kind of change in a fundamental social institution, which has no parallel in the change in the upper middle class, uh, has cascading effects. It has cascading effects on uh, the way children are raised, for the worse. It has effects on social capital. Um, you know, unmarried dads don't coach little league teams very often. It has uh, effects on male labor force behavior because of this will come as a surprise to everybody in the audience, but marriage civilizes men, and especially with regard to the labor force. And so you, you, have, you have a new lower class that diverges from a civic culture which formerly was much more unitary than it is now. We have a new upper class, and, and with regard to this specific audience, in many ways I'd focus on that <laughs> uh, in a lot of my remarks. Uh, causes of this, how is it different from the old new upper class? Well, a couple of things happened in the 20th century. One was that brains became much more valuable in the marketplace, something that all of you in this room will make a whole lot of money from. Uh, and the second thing that happened is that starting in the 1950s, basically, and accelerating thereafter, America's elite colleges became really efficient at finding talent wherever it was. And so places like Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Stanford, Berkeley, and the rest went from places that had lots of rich kids and a few smart ones to places that were filled with smart kids, some of whom were rich. This has had cascading effects. It's had cascading effects on uh, who people marry. And th that in turn has cascading effects on the culture. The increase in wealth means that people form critical masses in kinds of neighborhoods that did not exist in 1950. The elite neighborhoods in 1950 and 60 had most, the typical couple, the guy had a BA and the wife had a high school education. The, the marriages that occur today in the new upper class are sometimes less like marriages than mergers, where you have extremely qualified women marrying extremely highly qualified men, all very high IQs, living in enclaves that increasingly contain nobody but people like themselves. And the real problem with this is going to be in the second and third generation. If you've grown up in a working class or middle class environment, you can still remember what that's like as you become successful. 
if you have grown up in these elite bubbles, that's all you've ever known. Why is this bad? And this will conclude my remarks. What has made America exceptional has been our civic culture. And an, an intrinsic aspect of that civic culture was it's always been more important to all of us to be American than to be whatever class we were in. That's changing. So I'm not prognosticating the uh, decline of America's economic wealth or its political power or anything else. What scares me in this divergence of classes is an end to America as um, the America that we have known and treasured for the last couple of centuries. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, <laughs> you hadn't planned on any order here. Uh, David Brooks, you want to go next? I guess so. I'll mostly amplify what Charles said. Uh, first, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Ralph Nader has to go off and look at a bridge in Shanghai. He's going to fix that uh, <laughs> worker safety problem over there. Um, the only thing I... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the only thing I, I disagree with uh, so far is all the comments that you guys are the best and the brightest. I'm looking at a, I'm writing on a book on humility, and uh, I just want to tell you, you guys are not that special, actually. <laughs> uh, uh, the average self-made millionaire in this country had a C-minus college average, grade point average, so uh, you got a lot of disadvantages to overcome, as you said. <laughs> uh, uh, I didn't realize our title was Class Warfare. Uh, I actually have a long history of this. I grew up in a very lefty household, and uh, when I was five, my parents took me to a bee-in where hippies would go just to be in Central Park, and the hippies threw their wallets in a burning garbage can to demonstrate their liberation from money and material things, and I was five, and I saw a $5 bill on fire in the garbage can. I ran up and reached into the fire and grabbed it and ran away, uh, which was my first step over to the right. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I decided if we're going to have class warfare, I want to be on the winning side. <laughs> and so um, my, my only addition uh, here uh, to add right now to what Charles said will be to emphasize uh, the social and psychological aspects of this. And so if you go back to family structure back in uh, when I was a kid in the mid-60s, college-educated, high school-educated, had reasonably similar family structures. And now, as Charles indicated, that's not true. So the divorce rates are vastly different, college educated to high school in, in educated. Obesity rates are much different. Smoking rates are much different. Uh, and the way people raise their kids is much different. I reported in a column recently on some work Robert Putnam of Harvard did on the difference between these two family styles. He points out that over the last, um, I can't remember the, the exact time frame, but say 20, 30 years, the amount of time that highly educated parents spent with their kids has radically increased, while the amount of time high school educated parents spend with their kids is basically flatlined. Over the past, uh, this period, 20, 25 years, the amount of money college educated parents spent on their kids has increased by about $6,000 a year per kid. And that's money spent on tutors, travels, teams, uh, SAT prep, all this extracurricular stuff. Working class families can't afford 6000 bucks. there. They've ramped up their investment by about $500. And so that's led to this divergence, which is not only about money, it's about psychology. And so there's a whole bunch of work that's been done, reported in a book by a colleague of mine uh, named Paul Tuff called How Children Succeed, which is about stress and what early childhood stress does to people. There was a study many years ago where, called the ACE study, where they took a look at people and they just asked them some basic questions about how much stress they had in their life. Did you grow up in a child of divorce? Were you abused? Did a parent lose a job? And basically that early childhood stress is a great predictor of all sorts of things later in life because stress has impact on the brain. Uh, it makes it much harder to self-regulate, much harder to control impulses, much harder to plan ahead. Uh, and that stress is a powerful uh, has this economic and social stress has a powerful bad effect on people living in more disorganized neighborhoods. The second big effect is on attachments. There's a whole mountain of research called attachment theory. It's how do kids attach basically to mom at 18 months. And if you have an, a secure relationship with your mom at 18 months, you have a model in your head to how to relate to people. And when you get to school, you'll know how to relate to mom, you'll know how to, or teachers, you'll know how to relate to peers, and you'll probably do reasonably well in school. A University of Minnesota team took a look at attachment patterns at 18 months 
and could predict with 77% accuracy who was going to graduate from high school. And so these, about 55% of the kids in America are securely attached, 20% or so are avoidantly attached, and the rest are what they call have disorganized attachment. Those two latter categories, much lower life chances. And then the final thing has to do with just the m mentality of child rearing. And here I would just refer to a great sociologist named Annette Leroux, who wrote a book which I highly recommend called Unequal Childhoods, in which she says, we do not, have, we do not raise our kids on, upon a continuum. We have two entirely different child rearing styles. There's what she calls concerted cultivation, which is what I raise my kids, and I suspect a lot of you were raised where you're driving your kids everywhere, you've got flow charts on the refrigerator to see which parent is taking which kids which place. Uh, and the kids are born and mom's flashing little Mandarin flashcards at the thing. So they can get <laughs> uh, and so that's one style. The next style is uh, more working class, more prevalent in the working class where people say life is hard. We're going to let our kids have some freedom. Let them enjoy childhood. And those kids are much healthier as kids, but their chances as adults are diminished. And so I, I just would focus, and I'll try to come back to this. It's an economic issue, but it also has profound psychological impact. Thank you, David Brooks. We move on, Bill Galson, to you. Thanks. Well, you've just heard from one of America's leading comic sociologists, <laughs> you know, who's done a stand-up routine that I will not try to imitate. Uh, so as a partially defrocked college professor, let me... Let me parse the question before us in, into four. The, there's, first of all, the empirical question. What is actually going on? And I don't think there's any significant doubt about the fact that if you divide post-war American history into two equal chunks, uh, that the, in the second chunk, the last 33 years, we have become a very significantly more unequal society. Between 1979 and 2007, the top 1% in the United States correcting for taxes, tra government transfers, inflation, and changes in ho household size has seen an income increase of 281%. Median, median households have seen an increase of 25%. Uh, if you want a summary economically for the past, say, 30 years of American history, the top has been soaring the middle class has been stagnating, and the bottom has been stuck. And there are processes underway that are likely to replicate that pattern, which is even more serious than the pattern, pattern itself, for the reasons that Charles has previously stated. Uh, but economic inequality is not just a statistic. It has implications for economic classes and for, cl for class consciousness, to use a Marxist term. And there's no question about the fact that the consciousness of class conflict in the United States has risen quite dramatically, even in just the past few years. I reviewed a Pew Research Center survey recently that showed that just between 2009 and today, uh, the percentage of Americans seeing strong or very strong conflict between the rich and the poor in the United States has risen by, from 47% to 66%. That is a very abrupt change in a short period of time. And interestingly, most of that change has occurred among white Americans, you know, whose perception of that conflict has risen from 43% to 65% during that same period. So something is happening. That's the first question, the empirical question. And when you add to that the fact, which has been, I think, well demonstrated, that whatever may have been in the case in the past, social mobility in the United States is now well below average for OECD countries. If social mobility is the heart of the American dream, then the American dream is in jeopardy because of the trends that we're here to discuss today. Question number two, I'll be much briefer. Uh, the normative question, does this matter? My answer is yes, absolutely. First, for the reasons that Benjamin Disraeli gave in Britain in the 19th century, that, that Condoleezza Rice gave last night in her framing speech, and that Charles Murray just gave this morning. One nation, two nations. It makes a big difference. But more immediately, there is a lot of political science evidence to the effect that growing economic divergences are contributing to this pattern of deeply and increasingly po polarized politics that we've seen, and you've all seen the results of the polarized politics, the inability of the United States 
to come to agreement and to govern itself on the most fundamental questions we face. Third question, and this is where I guess the argument will begin, is what will be called, what I'll call the diagnostic question. Why is this happening? And let me just say, and I don't have time to go into details now, but just as a headline, I refuse to choose among economic explanations, social and cultural explanations, and political explanations. All three of those sectors of our collective life have had an important impact on the phenomenon of economic inequality and increasing class consciousness and class conflict. I have studied family policy passionately for 25 years. Everything that you just heard is true, but it's important to understand that it is not just the case that social patterns produce economic patterns. It is also the case that economic changes produce or at least contribute to the changing social patterns that are then replicated economically in the next generation. So things like family structure, parenting styles are both, in social science language, independent variables and dependent variables. They are both causes and effects and it's important as this conversation goes forward not to oversimplify that relationship. The fourth question is the pres prescriptive question, what should we do? And that's above my pay grade, so I'll stop here. <laughs> <laughs> that's also what we're going to take up in the next panel. But exactly. Thank you, that's Galton. why I'm stopping. Appreciate it. <laughs> Bob Reich. Uh, well, you're hearing a surprising amount of unanimity on the panel in terms of the direction that we are going in, uh, in terms of widening inequality. Uh, I think the real question is the question that Bill Galston raised, what's the cause? Uh, is the cause primarily uh, social uh, dysfunctions with regard to American families, uh, or is the cause primarily economic, or is there some interaction between the two? Uh, I am not a class warrior. Uh, I'm a class warrior, W-O-R-R, <laughs> I-O-R. I worry. Uh, about what's happening, uh, and I do pl place a greater stress on the economic explanations. Uh, by the way, uh, I want to welcome you as the one member of this panel who is from, who teaches here at Berkeley. I want to wel welcome all of you to Berkeley if you're not here already. Uh, I came to Berkeley for the first time in 1968. I drove my little Volkswagen up University Avenue and was immediately caught by the, the aroma, the, the aroma of... Uh, Eucalyptus mixed with tear gas, mixed with <laughs> mixed with marijuana. It was oh, a, there we go. <laughs> uh, it was. I, I, I then spent the next uh, 40 years trying to get back here. Um, Berkeley does have a reputation as being a hotbed of of concern about these uh, kinds of social issues, uh, but obviously it's not the only place, and the United States is not the only place where the divergence uh, in income and wealth and I should add political power, uh, is also happening. Uh, you see the same kind of pattern happening in most nations. Uh, so I think that we need to probe a little bit deeper as to the origins. I also want to go back in history. It's not just the post-Second World War where things get interesting. In fact, if you look at the United States and many other countries in the years leading up to the great crash of 1929, you see something uh, that parallels what we have experienced here in the United States. And that is that in two years in the past century, we have had a peak, that is a peak of the top 1% uh, earning the largest percentage of total income uh, at any other point in time. Those two years were 1928 and 2007. Uh, in both those years, uh, we had the top 1% earning over 23.5% of total income. Uh, and in the years preceding those peak years, those peak years of 1928 and 2007, uh, we experienced a middle class uh, whose wages were basically going nowhere. The median income was fairly stagnant. Uh, you also had economic growth, but most of the gains of growth and productivity improvements went to the very top. Uh, the middle class, to maintain their status and to maintain their quality of life, they borrowed, and they borrowed heavily. And those two great debt bubbles uh, 
both uh, in, in a sense housing bubbles, but not nearly uh, the same constitution and co same composition of debt, they both exploded. Uh, they exploded in 1929, and they exploded in 2008. Uh, I think that we can see in both periods uh, that inequality widened dramatically, and that widening inequality had not only economic <coughs> devastating results in terms of the Great Depression and the Great Recession, uh, but also had results in terms of political divisiveness. Uh, many of my colleagues here at Berkeley and other and places elsewhere, uh, other places have been studying political divisiveness, the extent to which uh, the parties are divided on major, many issues, and you see a similar uh, pattern tracking this widening inequality. In the 1920s, uh, we had a peak of political divisiveness, uh, just as we now seem to have a peak of political divisiveness. Uh, we also saw in both eras an extraordinary amount of money coming into politics. Uh, again, I think uh, very closely aligned uh, with uh, the concentration of income and wealth at the very top. Uh, social factors undoubtedly are important here. Uh, but the reason I am stressing the economic is that they are a, uh, inevitably a large part of the picture. Uh, and when we get to solutions, if we are only or primarily looking at social dynamics, it's much harder to conjure up solutions to social dynamics. Much easier to say, well, uh, the poor and uh, the lower middle class ought to change their lifestyles. Uh, the rich ought to be better models for the rest of the country. There's not that much we can do. Uh, but if we focus on the economic, uh, actually there is a world uh, that we can do. Uh, if we see that the great change, as Bill Galston said, in recent years happened between 1978 and 1983, that was the great U-turn, when we went from uh, a widespread prosperity in which the gains from economic growth were widely shared in this country uh, to widening divergence uh, when the gains from growth went almost entirely to the very top. Uh, we can look at that period and ask ourselves what specifically happened and what happened then uh, and what happened uh, again in the 1920s for slightly different reasons. What happened to us between 1978 and 1983 was two things. Uh, one word that has gone directly from obscurity to meaningless without any intervening period of coherence uh, and that is globalization. Uh, the second has to do with tremendous technological change and a lot of job displacement. Uh, and what I hope we get to is a discussion of why these two phenomena uh, have uh, not only changed the relationship between the economy uh, and who gets what, but also threatened uh, our social fabric in very, very profound ways. Let me pick up there. Bob Reich and, and just ask you directly and then uh, we'll go to the other participants on this because there seems to be some agreement that we have definitely become more unequal uh, but the causes behind it, uh, your emphasis on the economic, uh, perhaps Charles Moore on, or to a great degree on the cultural, uh, David Brooks bringing in social and, uh, and psychological and Bill Gostin talking also about a combination. I want to ask you directly how much, uh, one of the be perhaps the most primary examples we've seen of what we're calling class warfare is the Occupy movement. Did they get it right in the sense of 1%, because you mentioned the 1%, and 99%? Uh, well, uh, we began measuring, the, the standard way of measuring inequality, uh, either Gini coefficients, uh, the ratio of the top 10% to the bottom 10%, top 5% to the bottom 5%, top 20%, bottom 20%. Uh, that's the way we did it. Uh, but what we began to learn, uh, largely through the pioneering work of Emmanuel Says and Thomas Piketty, his colleague, Emmanuel Says is right here at Berkeley, uh, who looked at IRS tax returns uh, in ways that, uh, and we could not, never get that data, going back to 1913. What we learned uh, is that the real dramatic surge toward inequality in this country, uh, and I might add, uh, because they've done work uh, that are, is very illustrative and very illuminating of other countries. The dramatic surge is not between the top 10 or 20 percent and the bottom 10 or 20 percent. It's between the top 1 percent and everybody else, or between the top 1 tenth of 1 percent, or top 1 hundredth of 1 percent and everybody else. There has been an, a very dramatic concentration of income and wealth, and one might also add uh, political power, at the very, very top. Uh, and that is where 
uh, I think the Occupy movement and, and several other uh, uh, ancillary uh, movements and uh, certainly a lot of publicity has focused its attention. Well, in this uh, presidential campaign, we've heard a lot about 47 percent. And uh, I'm just prompted to ask you, Charles Murray, because in your book you make the distinction between Belmont and Fishtown. There's this kind of <laughs> divide. And you not only emphasize marriage, but you also emphasize faith. You emphasize community, social capital, all of these things that we would think of under the uh, rather wide swath of, uh, of cultural facts. Um, so how much do you see economics playing a singular role here or a predominant role here, and how much is really just culture changed by economics? Well, in another, quest another time in the discussion, I'm going to say I don't think the causes make that much difference anymore. But I'm, I'm going to respond directly to your question right now. Bob Putnam's book, Bowling Alone, a very famous book, identifies all the ways in which social capital started to go uh, on the slide. didn't happen in 1979 to 1983. The modal year in which everything turned around was 1964. And not only that, it was pretty concentrated. I mean, it's not that there were a few trends that went down in 1964-65. You take a look at all the different kinds of social capital Bob Putnam looked at, and 1964 is when they started to collapse. It was the last half of the 1960s, starting about 1964 again, that crime soared in this country. Not at a time in which we had growing inequality and uh, high unemployment, but at a time when unemployment was uh, sometimes below 4%, an overheated economy in many ways. Marriage didn't start to decline in 1979. It started to decline in the 1960s. Out-of-wedlock births didn't start to uh, rise in 1979. They started to rise skyrocket. I mean, the, the trend line just goes like this in the mid-1960s. If you're talking about the kinds of divergences in classes that uh, I discuss in Coming Apart, the great problem in identifying the portion that you assign to economics and the portion that you assign to policy changes, to cultural changes, and the rest seems to me to point toward a very large contribution by policy slash cultural changes because so much of it happened at a time when prosperity was at a peak and at a time when inequality as we now know it, economic inequality not grown. Um, however, having said that, I say that as an antidote to what Bob said, uh, uh, but that doesn't mean I don't think economics has played a role at all. Uh, However, the, the non-economic causes of this are important to understand because it helps explain why, even when we had a boom economy in the last half of the 1990s, you did not see a reversal in the kinds of trends uh, in labor force participation, uh, in, uh, uh, in social capital, in marriage, and the rest of it that, that we're in. Bill Galston, I want to go to you next because uh, you've written a lot about entitlements and many blame really this class consciousness that we see arising uh, to such a greater degree and becoming exacerbated to too much entitlement and the political polarization and the fact that you can't really get taxes through with Norquist's pledge that almost every legislator has signed. I mean, have we come to a point now where we're just at an impasse, we're at a cul-de-sac politically? <laughs> <laughs> Don't mention Grover Norquist, the bill. <laughs> Why would you move? Please take a drink okay, of water. Right. Can, I, can I leap in on this uh, well, 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 debate while he gets over his Grover thing? Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, there's a guy at UVA uh, called Eric Turkheimer who studies IQ uh, among, especially among kids growing up in poverty. Uh, and they basically don't have uh, nutrition sorts of things to live up to the, their IQ, their genetic potential. And so he is, uh, been he is asked, what causes this? What is it about the background that causes this? And so he spent a, a lot of years trying to isolate the specific things that cause this phenomenon. And he could not find a single thing that correlated mm. with the phenomenon. And so he said, it's an emergent system. It's a whole bunch of things emerging together, and they create this phenomenon. But if you try to look for the individual causes, he uses the phrase, the gloomy prospect. It's too dark. You'll never see down there. And that's basically my answer to this. We have, as Charles indicated, 
a cultural movement starting in the mid-60s, which did weaken social capital. We indubitably also had an economic movement, uh, having, in my view, more to do with technological change than globalization, having to do with lower job uh, prospects for people without high skills. Forgive me, David, and we also had a recession, a major recession. I think that's <coughs> well, this is in the economic sense. Well, well, no, this is a trend that, that transcends the business cycle. Uh, this is something that's been going on for decades. And so these two things fed with one another. And just to bring it to a concrete circumstance, too, first, the Atlantic Monthly did a story about a young woman who l works in a factory in South Carolina uh, who was working about nine bucks <coughs> an hour. She wants to work at the job that can get her 14 to 20 bucks an hour. But what skills would it take for her to move from point A to point B? It would basically take two years of education uh, to work in a, a modern factory. Uh, but she's got a, a couple kids and no, no husband. And so she can't get that education. And so that's an example of how um, social problems and economic problems <laughs> intertwine. And then the second one is you find uh, this collapse in marriage. Why has this happened? In part, it's purely social. Uh, people have life scripts where they say to themselves now, I'm going to get a job, I'm going to get wealthy, and then, and then I'm going to have kids, and then I'm going to get married. Like marriage is at the end of the train, when I think it used to be at the beginning of the train. And so that's purely social. On the other hand, you meet a lot of women who just can't find a guy to marry because the guys don't have uh, uh, economic prospects. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I would say uh, my answer to that is not a very conservative answer, but it's earned income tax credits and wage subsidies to make more guys marriageable. Uh, and, so, uh, and, and so that's, that's the interplay of these forces. And I, I think there's no teasing of heart because they inter interact. Mm. You got your voice back? <coughs> more or less. <laughs> My apologies to the assembled company. Well, first of all, be before I get to the answer to your question, which will be, <coughs> which will be brisk, I do want to spend a little bit more time reflecting on this interplay between or the intertwining of, to use, to use David's phrase, um, economics and culture or society. Because I think it is, it is not irrelevant to try to look at the relative, com uh, relative contribution of those two great forces even before we get to the third, namely political and policy choices. And here, I'll put a couple of data points on the table. The first is the city of Detroit. Now, I suppose one could say the city of Detroit collapsed because marriage collapsed, but I don't think that's the right way to pick up the handle, quite frankly. The city of Detroit collapsed because the automobile industry collapsed. And why did the automobile industry collapse? That's a long story, but it has a lot to do with international competition. It has a lot to do with the complacency of General Motors and the rest of the automobile industry. It has a, a lot to do with antiquated production processes. It has a lot to do with very poor quality. It has a lot to do with the incapacity of automobile companies and their managements to respond for a full generation to these pressures that everybody could see, et cetera, et cetera. But if you ask me, why has a substantial portion of the American middle uh, become less well off? Uh, the answer is that the American, the American economy built on a foundation, an essential, a foundation of industries that were very, very uh, competitive at a time that we had no competition, but were not competitive or decreasingly competitive at a time that we had increased competition. So that's point number one. How do we explain what has happened to Detroit? And I'm, I'm open to sociological explanations of the collapse of Detroit, but I'll be a hard sell. Here's point, num here's point number two. Uh, uh, a very, very good labor economist by the name of David Autor, A-U-T-O-R, whose work everybody in this room should be aware of, uh, has looked at the impact of technological change on the American job structure. And here's what he has found, that the impact of technological change in the past generation has been most pronounced in the middle of the structure. It turns out that there are a bunch of jobs that can be 
replaced by technology in the middle of the wage and occupational spectrum. You cannot replace nursing home orderlies with technology very easily, but you can produce a lot of people doing uh, jobs that are somewhere between blue collar and white collar using technology. And so what we have now is a U with lots of demand for relatively low skilled, low pay jobs, lots and increasing demand for people at the top of the skill level, uh, but diminished demand for the sorts of skill levels and occupations that during the period in which the American middle class was doing well constituted the backbone of the American middle class. Now, is this the, is, is this the sole explanation for what's happening and why we're having this discussion? No, it isn't. But what I'm pushing back against is A, the proposition that the social changes are obviously more important than the economic changes, and B, that it makes no difference which is which. Why is it then, you mentioned Detroit, I mean, um, there's, there's certainly probably at this point more emphasis on economics and everybody's read Marx and, you know, I think it was during the Clinton administration which you served in where <coughs> you heard, first heard that phrase, uh, it's the economy stupid. Um, but you're reminding me of Jeremy Rifkin's work, the end, of work uh, the end of Work, where he talks about all these jobs disappearing because of the global economy and technology. You look at Detroit and by contrast look at Germany and why has Germany a more homogenous society admittedly, but why have they in this technological global economy been able to succeed and succeed to such a great degree in contrast, is it just the auto industry that just bottomed out, Rod Bob Reich? Uh, well in Germany you have uh, two things uh, going that we have either lost or we don't have. Uh, one, you have still fairly strong labor unions. Uh, if you look at the period between 1978 and 1983 that I talked about before as marking the great U-turn in terms of where we went from an economy in which we broadly shared the benefits of economic growth to an economy in which almost all the benefits went to the top, uh, you see that it parallels almost dramatically the decline of labor unions uh, in this country. Germany still has strong labor unions. Germany also uh, is investing dramatically in education, <coughs> not just uh, the kind of academic college-oriented education we have. Uh, Germany for years has invested in technological and technical education, uh, vocational and technical education. Uh, so many of uh, young Germans who do not go on to a four-year college education become technically proficient. Uh, Germany is still a major export of a manufacturer, of precision manufacturing. Uh, that's high value added, highly productive. Why? Because their labor force is extraordinarily technologically proficient and they can do that. Uh, the German median wage, uh, adjusted for inflation and adjusted for purchasing power parity, so we really do get a picture of Germany versus the United States, the median wage there is higher than the median wage here. Uh, so, uh, the, and I don't want to get into this afternoon's discussion, but some combination of labor unions, uh, education, uh, David, I think uh, not just for making men more marriageable, but also for making the entire system work better, I think in a broadening of the earned income tax credit uh, and, uh, and similar uh, tax provisions uh, would go a long way to making us not just look more like Germany, uh, but more importantly, making us more like we, we looked uh, between the Second World War and 1980. We get to a, an essential argument here, and I know, Charles, you want to come in here, because as a libertarian, I think government and intervention and the idea that government should play a predominant role in trying to steer things more toward equity uh, probably may be short of anathema to you, uh, and yet there are those who look to Scandinavia and Germany as models for us. You don't see it that way, I presume. Well, actually, I, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and say what I wanted to say independently of that question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just do it. Don't tell them. Right. <clears throat> no, I'm a rule abider, you know. Right. This, this is a lot like the first presidential Look, debate. <laughs> <laughs> Which one am I? Um, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Look, I, I want to make a case for uh, a, common, a common cause across the political spectrum and saying, you know, to some extent, the cause don't matter that much anymore. And let's take, uh, and referring to the uh, development of what I call the new lower class, and let me give you, go back to the example of marriage. And here's where I think economists and social scientists like the people 
uh, on this platform uh, are well served by hanging out in working class neighborhoods. Uh, I say that because I live in a working class slash middle class town of, of 272 people and in a larger working <coughs> class area, so I can say I've been living there since 1989. And I will tell you what happens when you ask the young woman who has a couple of kids and has not gotten married why she didn't marry the father. And what she will say to you is something like this. Uh, why should I marry that clown? I mean, he's, he's a nice guy. Uh, uh, I, I really like him. But uh, bringing him into the family would be like bringing another child into the family. He plays his video game six hours a day. Uh, he can't hold on to a job even when jobs are around. He gets a job. Two days later, he gets in a fight with his supervisor and he gets fired. Or he, he uh, is, is high on weed and doesn't show up on time and, and he uh, loses his job. He never hasn't held a job at all uh, regularly. They don't say to you, gee, Joe has been out there looking for a job real hard. He just can't find one. Um, that's not the story. So let's say that, that Bob and, and Bill's general approach. I mean, their general approach says the economy has a whole hell of a lot to do with this. Suppose they're right. And that these guys have been demoralized in the past, or maybe they've grown up in a family where they never saw the father work, and so they've never become job ready. Mm -hmm. um, suppose that's all true. Or suppose that my version that we took a huge wrong turn in the 1960s in the rules of the game that we established for low-income young people that led to disastrous mistakes that they make as young people, which forever after destroys their chances. Suppose I'm right. It, at this point, it doesn't make any difference because suppose that it was the economy and that these guys are feckless, a good, useful word that's seldom used these days. They are feckless because of economic changes. They're still feckless, okay? Right. okay? And so when you provide jobs, you say, oh, we've got this great job opportunity out there for you. We're, gonna, we're going to have government supp supply jobs. You, you name the solution. You are not going to get the response that you would get if the guys who were unemployed really wanted to work, were ready to work, but just couldn't find jobs. You say you too many of these guys have learned to game the system. You're, 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 you're going to get very little response from, from because whatever the causes were, we are now looking at profound cultural changes in working class America uh, that did not apply 50 years ago and would have made all sorts of solutions possible then. That won't work very well now. There has to be cultural shifts of a major kind. Well, forgive me, you are saying that too many have learned how to game the system, are you not? It's not quite that uh, hard-hearted. I'm, I'm saying that you have an awful, when I use the word feckless, what I mean is that you have lots of males out there who just can't function very well in the world of work. They don't know how. For, for reasons that are really hard to remedy. And how much of that, though, has to do with the fact that we're a service economy now and we don't have the manufacturing jobs or we don't have the kind of positions that working class people did for years and years? Uh, you know, one of the things that really puzzles me is why we think all these manufacturing jobs were so much better than non-manufacturing jobs. Working on an assembly line is one of the most mind-numbing things there is. Uh, working in a, another kind of skilled job where you're outside, where you're creating things of, of beauty or utility or solving people's problems, a lot's more fun, and they can also pay very well. Uh, we have done a very poor job of taking high school kids and telling them that the choice in life is not between being a physician and an attorney or working at Walmart that there are lots of really interesting ways of making a living out there, but you do have to have training for them. We have treated vocational training, and I'm definitely on Bob's side in the value of the German example here. We have treated vocational training as second best. We have held up the BA, this piece of paper that is effectively meaningless, unless you know where the person went to school and what they studied. We've held that up as a measure of educational success, and I think a great deal of the solutions that we will turn to at some point will have to do with a fundamental change in America's educational system. But one could argue also, David Brooks, let me bring you into this, that there's not being, in fact, I think most of you would probably agree, there's simply not being enough done in the earlier stages of life, pre-kindergarten, preschool, and so forth. Again, there's always the 
bringing up of the paradigm of the European model that they do things, especially in France, uh, to a much greater degree to help kids. This is, I mean, you've written columns about this, how you, you start forming kids' ideas and their education at an earlier stage, you're going to have a much more, well, equitable society, more social mobility. Yeah. First, I, I think, Charles, I don't know if you'd agree, I think there are sort of two problems of the inequality at the bottom half. I would say first there's the, the feckless underclass, I wouldn't use that word, but the, what you just described. But then I think there are, there's a chunk of people who are, have been working, have basically been working all their lives except for during recessions, but whose wages are still stagnating or are still falling behind. And so it seems to me there are two different categories there. That's, that's true. And so, so that's one thing. But secondly, to deal with the, the second category, basically I think what part of what has to happen, as I mentioned, and the EITC and wage subsidies, I think that has to be a piece of it. But I do think you have to uh, have human capital policy. And basically, you need to, you know, you take a, a young woman who's 14, she wants, she's lonely, she wants to be a mom, it would make her feel emotionally fulfilled, and so she decides <laughs> to have a kid at 14 or 15. Uh, why has she made that decision? You have no clue. You really don't know. There are a million things that contribute somebody to go in that way. So my view is when you take a modest understanding of how complicated these issues are, then you basically flood the zone and try everything at once. And so that means you start with nurse family partnerships, you do early childhood education, you do mentoring, you do boys and girls club, you get as many social organizations in the, in the neighborhood as possible, you do these no excuses, KIPP type schools, you do mentoring programs in college. You ju it's n human capital is like nutrition. You just have to do it all the time. And to me, the, you know, one of the approaches is this thing, Harlem Children's Zone. And so to me, that's introducing structure and relationships, basically it's relationships. If a person has more personal, close personal relationships of a variety of sorts, they're likely to lead the sort of lives that is gonna lead to economic success. And if they have grow up with a paucity of stable relationships, it's just gonna be a lot harder. How much of the role is governments in terms of fostering those so kind of social institutions and attachments? Reasonably significant. I think if you talk about, I mean, I, I would like to see a lot more social money spent on you know, I, I was the only actual believer in compassionate conservatism, it turns out. Uh, but I, I, uh, um, I, no, there's, uh, there's one more. <laughs> Your peer at the Washington Post, Mike Gerson. Mike Gerson. Okay, there are two of us. There, there you um, go. <laughs> and, and Bush on even number of days. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and so I think a lot of that uh, social capital building has to be done. But I, I think it, it's, it's unquestionable that uh, this is a long-term process that has to begin with better early childhood. I mean, the Jim Heckman rule, uh, learners learn and skill begets skill. So the earlier the investments, the better. Uh, but basically, you have to take places that are disorganized and make them more organized. And this, by the way, happened in American society. In 1820, if you were a, um, your average guy, you drank a lot after work, you came home, you roughed up the people at home, and that was normal. That was just the norm. By 1835, 1840, that was not the norm. And that had a lot to do with temperance movements and things like that, which turned into the abolition movement, by the way. Uh, and it had to do with uh, some social changes as well as legal changes. And Bill Galston, you wanted in here. Yeah, absolutely, because you know, having introduced disharmony into the conversation, uh, now let me let me try to be a little bit more conciliatory. Uh, first of all, the impact of family dysfunction or the failure of families ever to form in, the, in, their, in their traditional form is profound. There's no question about that. A, one of our country's best sociologists, Christopher Jenks, did a study of what was called, you know, 10 years ago, the black-white achievement gap. And what he and his colleagues found was that if you look at the gap that occurs between those two demographic groups in, at the end of 12th grade, Fully half of it was attributable to differences that kids brought with them to their very first day of school. And those differences then built on themselves for Jim Heckman's reasons. Now, there is no way, it seems to me, of asking the educational system to be 100% responsible for fixing a problem that they're only 50% responsible for causing. That is simply an unreasonable expectation. If we, do, if we don't do something, and a lot more than we're now doing between age zero and age five, 
then the problems that we're talking about today, we could reconvene this discussion in 30 years and we could be talking about them still in very much, very much the same, the same terms. And, and if families in their most functional form are not creating themselves at the bottom, then some other force needs to step in, as the phrase goes, in loco parentis, in the place of the parents. And there are two candidates there. There are civil society institutions, you know, churches and voluntary organizations, and there are also public programs uh, that can help out with visiting nurses, with a much higher quality uh, pre-K education system than we now have, much more universal, especially where it's, where it's needed, needed the most. But it's also the case, and here I will, you know, once again be harmonistic, that civil society institutions can make a big difference, and some of the trends that Charles has been talking about can actually be changed in, in, in that way. For example, when I left the White House in 1995, I got together with a small band of other people to found an organization called the National Campaign to Prevent Teen Pregnancy, the thesis being that teen pregnancy was not a very good way to start out a life as an adult uh, and generally, general, generally meant that prospects for you and your children were going to be very poor. Guess what? Since the early 1990s, the teen pregnancy rate in the United States has declined by 49%. It is possible to mobilize civil society institutions to change some of these negative trends. I'm not saying that all of the other statistics that Charles cited are not true. They are true. And we need to mobilize as a society to do something about them as well. Now, Robert Rice, you want to say something? Well, I, I think this conversation uh, is lacking a sense of urgency. Uh, yes, we can do something about the schools. Yes, we can do something about early childhood education. Uh, conservatives want everybody to get married, except gays. Uh, we can, uh, you know, we can probably <laughs> encourage uh, more people get, to get married. Uh, but look, we are facing a presidential election uh, in less than four weeks. Uh, at the heart of this presidential election is the question of who gets what. Are the wealthy going to have to pay more in taxes, or are they going to get a big tax cut? Are we going to see 60 or 62 percent of the budget uh, that goes right now to the poor and lower middle class for everything from Head Start uh, to Pell Grants for college be cut uh, to finance a major cut uh, in taxes for the rich? Or are we going to see a more equitable budget in the future? How are we going to deal with the budget deficit when we have all of these social problems to deal with and we see widening inequality? Uh, the 400 richest uh, people in America now uh, have more wealth than the bottom 150 million put together. Uh, you know, I am all in favor of doing something over the long term and changing our kind of mixture of culture and sociology, uh, but it's not enough and it doesn't deal with what de we are dealing with over the next year or two or three. Now, every presidential election we hear, this is the most important presidential election uh, that we've come across, uh, particularly by candidates. You feel that sense of urgency, David Brooks, that we're hearing from Bob Rice? I think it's the most important presidential election in the last four years, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I never, I always discount that. Uh, first, first, uh, first on what Bob said, first, I do think it's important to distinguish between the two different inequality problems. One is the top 1% problem, and second is the college-educated versus non-college-educated problem. I'm not a big fan of the top 1%. It's mostly, um, it's hedge fund guys, uh, it's a lot of surgeons, uh, and I think they're overpaid. And I'm, uh, I think Charles has spoken about this, but I'll summarize it because I believe in it. Uh, in 1980s or 70s, we in the media decided, you know, we'll print CEO salaries because when they see their salaries broadcast, they'll be so embarrassed they won't ask for more. <laughs> and that was uh, not the best understanding of human nature. <laughs> uh, and so now it's become the scoreboard. So that's sort of, I, I do think that's the problem. But that's not the core problem. The core problem is the, is the one that affects uh, between college and high school. If we had the top 1% doing what they're doing and high school people or high school dropouts were doing okay, I'd be fine with that basically. And I don't think they're particularly related. And I'm not going to try to argue Bob economics, but I don't think the top 1% really caused the financial crack up. But as for what this election does, I think both parties are seriously at fault. 
First, the Republican Party, the Ryan budget takes domestic discretionary spending, which is all the stuff spent on all this stuff, including education, down from a historic norm of about 3 or 4% down po to about 1.8%. Now, Ryan knows that's ridiculous. It is, first, that's ridiculous. That's not going to happen. That shouldn't happen. Ryan knows it's ridiculous, but he, it's his, sort of his first bargaining position. Uh, so that I would fault the Republican Party for having no vision on social equity. I would fault the Democratic Party for this fact that if we if we're talking today, the class war is in part a generational war. The government is a gigantic engine taking money away from young families and directing it to affluent seniors. And I would fault the Democratic Party for having really no entitlement strategy. And if you want money to sp be spent at the stuff we've been talking about, you've really got to take it away from affluent seniors and their health care. And so I fault the Democratic Party for not doing anything about that. So I, I would say both parties are pretty equally bankrupt on this particular issue. And Bill Galston, as someone who has served in the White House, uh, let's talk about the political campaign since that's come up. And uh, you see this uh, in some ways as being perhaps using the rhetoric of class warfare. That is, uh, the Republicans are saying on the one hand that the Democrats are using class warfare in this campaign. And uh, on the other hand, the Democrats are bringing up Romney's wealth and Bain Capital and firing people and him being a one percenter and so forth. It's really kind of centered on that, hasn't it? Yes, to some extent it has, and for the reasons that David just stated, I'm not sure that that's the most productive conversation to have. You know, the problems that we're gathered here to talk about, I think, will not be resolved by the outcome of that very narrowly targeted conversation. Uh, I personally think, uh, as a veteran of the Clinton White House, that a top tax rate of 39.6% on, on earned income is not an impediment to vigorous economic growth. Drop a footnote to the, Clinton, the, the two Clinton terms. And so the argument that if taxes at the top go up, that that will be job killing, that is pure rhetoric with no foundation whatsoever. On, and by the way, by two to one, the American people support the proposition that that tax rate should go up. That is to say, they support the position that the Bush tax cut should be continued for the, for the bottom 98% and ended for the top 2%. If there were an up or down vote as a national referendum, that would win, and it deserves to win. Having said that, it would make very little difference. That's not the point. The point is these broader issues that we're talking about. And the question, it seems to me, is not so much how much the people at the very top or do, are doing, but rather how the rest of the people are doing, whether it's a zero-sum game, which I don't think it is, and whether, and this is my word to the people in the audience, whether the people in the top 1% will accept their due measure of responsibility to participate in these problems and to lead American society or whatever society you're coming from in a more productive direction. What astounds me, and I've said this to business groups across the country, is how quiet the thoughtful and knowledgeable leaders of the business community have been in the face of this kind of absurd debate that David Brooks has very ac accurately characterized. It is only in the past couple of months that the progressive business community has gotten together around a very simple proposition. Enough is enough. There is a sensible way forward, and if, the, if our political system is too stupid to pursue it, then by God, maybe organized pressure from the private sector will force them to, and I hope they can. Well, let me, make the, let me make the case for uh, it doesn't make any difference who wins. Um, in terms of the problems we're talking about, I feel passionately about the upcoming election, uh, and uh, who I want to win and who I want to lose, but it's not going to have any effect on the problems I'm talking about. Suppose, as a thought experiment, suppose we could know for certain, never mind how, that if candidate X wins, the following will happen. We will have an economic boom. We will create millions of new jobs. Unemployment will be around the 4% uh, region. Uh, and these jobs will include lots of jobs uh, for low-skill workers. Furthermore, these are not going to be minimum wage jobs. This will be an environment in which the median wage, hourly wage, 
for uh, blue-collar jobs and service jobs is uh, $18 an hour, $17 an hour, around in there. That is going to happen if you vote for candidate X, and you know that for certain, so of course you all want to go out and vote for him. I have just described the environment that applied from about 1995 to 2000, 2001, mm -hmm. around, around that area. Um, it was a prolonged state of available jobs at okay wages. They were stagnant wages, okay. Wages have not gone up, That's all that's true. But they were wages whereby if you were a two-parent family and both of you worked, you were way above the median family income in this country. You were sixty, seventy thousand uh, dollars Nothing changed in regard to marriage. Nothing, to, uh, I think, no, marriage got worse in the working class during then. In terms of males, healthy, uh, prime age, white males dropping out of the labor force, the good news was they stopped dropping out as fast. The, the, the rising dropout rate flattened for a while and then continued to go up again. Uh, in terms of, of the social capital disintegration in the working class, that continued apace. So if nothing improved with about five really, really good years in a row on the kinds of problems that, that perplex us about the new lower class, then this successful presidential candidate who can replicate that experience, I don't think can reasonably expect to see much progress on them either. David Brooks. I agree. <laughs> uh, I, I sort of agree. I, I do think uh, it would, uh, I, I do think there would be some effect if the incentives for getting decent wages, uh, jobs were, uh, if we had a growing economy. But I, I do think, and I do think it's a problem for Republicans in particular because a, a core faith of the Republican Party now is that a rising tide lifts all boats. And I think Charles's book um, puts that deeply into question. Mm -hmm. hey, Bob Rice. Uh, well, I, I disagree with, with Charles. I think that if we faced uh, a choice uh, like the country faced in 1992, 1993, uh, and could reelect the Clinton administration uh, and have 22 million net new jobs, and by the way, I was, lab I was Labor Secretary during those years. I single-handedly created... I, I, meant, <laughs> I meant to say that. I meant to say that, Bob. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but, uh, but I think that the underlying problem, uh, the underlying structural problem that we never really were able to deal with uh, for a whole variety of reasons uh, is the wage issue, Charles. Uh, wages did stagnate. In fact, the median wage continued to drop for men. And this is important. The male median wage adjusted for inflation has been dropping since around 1978, 79, depending upon exactly how you measure it. And when that male median wage continues to drop, what happens to family structure? What happens to everything else? Uh, I mean, women came soaring into the workplace, into paid work in the 1970s, 1980s. I wish I could tell you that the reason women went into paid work in the 70s and 80s was because of these marvelous, wonderful professional opportunities opened to women. And that was not the major reason. Women went into paid work largely to prop up family incomes that were being impacted by the decline of male wages. Uh, the and, and again, because of globalization, the decline of manufacturing, the decline of unions, uh, the decline of uh, the, the substitution of uh, technology for work. Uh, and when the median family could no longer rely upon even two wage earners, uh, to do it. In fact, I remember uh, as I was Secretary of Labor, I'd look over the data and I'd talk to people all over the country where they were working, the typical family was putting in uh, a number of hours that we had never seen before. I used to call these families DINS, D-I-N-S. I came up with an acronym, meaning double income, no sex. Uh, because they were, everybody was working all the time. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but when that ran out, that was, that was a temporary coping mechanism. And when that coping mechanism ran out, uh, housing prices started to go up. So the middle class started to borrow against their homes. And that was another way of coping temporarily uh, with stagnant or declining male wages. Actually, you're reminding uh, well, me, Bob, well, but of, uh, excuse me, just uh, thinking about Lenore Weitzman's work, I'm sure you're familiar with Harvard sociologist, who said when you think about the pill and the feminist revolution, those things contributed along with the economy. So we're talking culture and economics again. 
to the decline in terms of uh, marriages and, and that as a, as a sustainable uh, institution the way it had been. Charles, you were going to add something here? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, the, you, in, in coming apart, if you look at the chapter on industriousness and take a look at uh, hours per w uh, worked per week uh, by males and females and so forth among working class men, I, I don't recall, Bob, the, that phenomenon you're talking about that, that we've seen among men, with one exception. Married men in the working class continue to work hard, and they work about as hard as they ever did. But hours per week among those who had jobs, among other males, dropped. Charles, I don't care whether people get married. Why are you so worried about marriage? <laughs> because it's the most important cultural institution in any society. Well, I mean, uh, uh, more, than <laughs> more than half of Swedes and Norwegians no longer get married. That's, I mean, oh, that's I mean, misleading. Uh, go ahead. That's Charles, no that one. <laughs> <laughs> it is so punishing to be married in Sweden uh, financially that, uh, it, that, that you'd be crazy to get married in Sweden. The, 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 and the Swedes had, Swede. in fact, the de facto families that have been living as husband and wife and raising kids into their teens, as opposed to cohabitation in the United States, which is nasty, uh, short, brutish, and whatever the other thing is. Uh, no, Bob, I guess, you know what, because you're such a reasonable guy and we get along on so many things. For you to ask me, why do you care whether people get married, flabbergasting. Because if you think about how communities work, and especially American communities, where we're supposed to live in places where we solve problems for ourselves, historically, the family has been the reason it works. Social capital is overwhelmingly produced by parents who are trying to shape the environment for their children. Overwhelmingly. And, and when you have the kind of deterioration of marriage that we've had in the working class, it wouldn't make any difference how much money you pour in. Social capital is bottom falls out of it. Um, to my mind, nothing is going to change unless we have, once again, marriage being the building block in, in working class. But do you, do you really, and I, and I just, just want to ask Charles one, thing one question. Because if you believe Hannah Rosen in the Atlantic Monthly, it's getting worse before it gets better. She talks about a hookup culture. She talks about the idea that young women don't need husbands anymore, and they look at it as uh, interfering with their careers and their yeah. advancement. Yeah, well, that's, the, that's the hookup culture at places like Berkeley, and that I wouldn't worry about. Uh, well, <laughs> you personally? I, I would like to join it, but yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, one, one of the perversities. Where is C-SPAN when we did it? One of the perversities of being here and having this discussion is that Berkeley is supposed to be, um, you know, hippy dippy bohemian place. But I guarantee you, especially for the people who live in the hills here, they live the most traditional lives imaginable. That they think left, but they live right. And then you go to, you know, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. People, you know, they're listening to country music, very traditional values. They're thinking right, but they're living left. Yeah. Uh, and so you've yeah. got a uh, weird uh, disjunction on both ends. Well, coming up on a break, and Bob Rice, you wanted to add something. No, I, I just uh, wanted to ask Charles that if, uh, if we could come up with some sort of a set of incentives uh, to get uh, many, many more people married, uh, do you think that that would really do anything to reverse the trends toward inequality we're now seeing? Toward economic inequality? Toward economic, oh, inequality, toward toward economic inequality. inequality. No. Not, well, no, then why are we... No, no, yeah. the, reason, the, reason I, the reason I gave that somewhat flippant answer is because I think that the effects of economic inequality are trivial compared to the effects of, of uh, cultural inequality. So that when we talk about how children are being raised in these early years in, of life, um, the deficits that go on there are not driven because they don't have enough money to talk to their children. They don't have enough money to interact with their kids in the ways, with consistent discipline and so forth, which we know uh, are the ways that kids do well. You have a deterioration of parenting practices in the working class, which have nothing to do with money. So. You're actually talking to a guy who thinks that economic inequality is a pretty trivial issue compared to the rest of it. Right, let's leave it there because uh, I, part of my role here is uh, to come in at a particular time, and this is the time. We're going to take a 30-minute break. It's great to have you here. We're going to begin again, and we're going to talk some more with the panelists, and then we're going to bring you in. And it's very important that 
A lot of people were talking to me during the break about wanting to ask certain questions, wanting to bring up certain points. It's an opportunity for you to do that, and please don't feel inhibited. First, I want to ask uh, Tom Siebel to come back up here. He's got an important message he wants to communicate to you. Tom? Okay, thanks, everybody. I just you know, wanted to leave you with a thought. You know, as we were uh, preparing uh, for this, this, these discussions this morning and this afternoon, um, we, we were kind of an active discussion, and uh, Secretary Rice uh, asked, uh, I think, a particularly incisive question. He said, Tom, what do you want to accomplish here? And, and, and our response was that what we want to accomplish in the course of this weekend is we want everyone here, when they leave, to be thinking somehow differently, to have a new idea, a new thought about this subject of class and class conflict in America. We want that thought to have come out of a discussion or presentation or a dialogue that happened here and we want you to remember for the rest of your life that, that change in the way you're thinking happened here. So that, that, that's the objective. So that's a, that's a pretty high bar for everyone. Now, the, mo this, the most important comment that I wanted to make is in the kind of the interaction model that we're looking for, okay? I assure you, okay, let me tell you how we were able to attract such a distinguished uh, uh, group of experts and thought leaders to engage with us this w in the course of this weekend. Uh, Secretary Reich and Neil Ferguson and Charles and Bill, okay, they, they were not willing to come here to talk at you, okay? The reason, the way that we got them to get, come here was to talk with you. So importantly, in the breaks, during lunch, at dinner, in the hallway, the reason that these people are here, I mean, Take advantage, this is the experience of a lifetime, and please take advantage of, this, of, of, of that opportunity, to the opportunity of a lifetime, and please take advantage of that opportunity to engage with these people one-on-one -on -one in all, in, you know, every opportunity that's being provided to you. So with that, Michael, back to you. Thank you, Tom. You know, sometimes uh, when we have a break like this, it's just interesting to eavesdrop and to hear about what people talk about in the aftermath of the, of the earlier panel. And all of you saw uh, Secretary Rice's, uh, heard Secretary Rice speak last night, and she was talking about really the American dream and the impediments uh, that it faces, formidable to say the least. I'm wondering if we've reached a point now, and we might begin with this, uh, because uh, Charles was saying during the break, boy, we've talked a lot about the lower class, what about the upper class? Uh, I'm wondering just how mobile we are now in terms of social mobility and in terms of moving up. When Secretary Rice said, there's little opportunity now to break through for so many and to get the kind of education that the upper class seems to be able to avail itself of. We get into that question, I think, head on here. We're talking about not only the problem, but the problem as it's become uh, more, well, as the gap has widened. Are we at a point now where we have these two classes so separated that to some extent, I mean, I can tell you, I'm a working class kid. I come from working class mm -hmm. family, I'm proud of it. And I live in Marin County now, and some of you from the Bay Area know that. So I live in a pretty nice bourgeois-style life. I don't know if it's that, and it's not because I'm a professor or a talk show host in public radio, believe me, because I'm married <laughs> to a wealthy lawyer. Uh, <laughs> but I'm Mobility wondering, any way you can. So marriage is important. <laughs> <laughs> How mobile are we? How much opportunity is there, aside from you know marrying up or marrying well, to really make those moves to? You, we got a real paradox, uh, it, and it is this: there has never been a better time to be academically talented and poor than today. Unlike 50 years, well, unlike 60 years ago. 50 years ago, it already changed. But 60, 70 years ago, uh, or my father, for that matter. Um, was academically talented, never got to college. If you're academically talented now, you will be discovered no matter where you are if you make the slightest effort to exhibit your talent. Uh, we've got a really good track record on that. The problem is that there is an, an inherent contradiction built into an efficient meritocracy. I'm talking now not about a meritocracy that goes all the way across the board, 
but among really bright kids, kids like you. The more efficient the meritocracy, the faster the churning in terms of social mobility at the beginning, and the faster that churning subsides. Uh, the dynamic is inevitable. Uh, that uh, you get all this churning at the beginning, all these kids come from little towns and, and ghettos and, uh, and other disadvantaged backgrounds. They go to Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Stanford. Uh, they, uh, they don't go back. Furthermore, they marry, as I mentioned earlier this morning, people who are probably just about as talented as they are. If you imagine that process going on for a period of decades and across the country, you have a significant phenomenon of a layer cake starting to form. Because forget about whether it's nature or nurture. You don't need to think about genes and environment here. The correlation between midpoint parental IQ and child IQ is about 0.5, which is by no means perfect, but it's in social science, it's pretty high. And what happens then is that over time, increasingly, the next generation of really talented kids increasingly comes from the upper middle class as a result of the success of meritocracy. And the statistics, this doesn't mean that there are no smart kids left uh, outside the upper middle class. Don't exaggerate what I'm saying. I'm saying as a phenomenon, it's broad enough and it's been going on long enough to be real and we see it in the statistics on uh, SAT scores, which are not driven by going to Kaplan for test prep. Uh, they're driven, unfortunately, in a way by IQ. And, uh, and we are seeing, increasingly, the upper middle class generating a way disproportionate uh, part of the next generation of talented kids. Well, if impetuosity is any sign of disagreement, I think Robert Reich uh, is due here for some statement. Uh, his hand went up almost soon. I mean, I, 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 with all due respect, when Charles talks about academically talented or uses the word talented, watch your wallets. Uh, we don't know a great deal about what talent means uh, apart from the context in which people have an opportunity to display uh, whatever they have. Uh, IQ uh, is notoriously culturally connected and bound. IQ is not an objective measure. Uh, when kids go to lousy schools, and one thing we know about the widening gap in the United States is that we are widening geographically. We are concentrating different incomes in geographic areas. It used to be, when I was a kid, uh, I went to a lower middle class uh, school, but in my community there were rich kids who also was, uh, were at the school, and there were poor kids. Uh, there was a lot of diversity in the town, in that local school. Today, there is far less diversity socioeconomically in any given school. Poor kids tend to go to school with other poor kids, and they tend to go to school in poor towns. They don't have models around them of people who are succeeding, who are moving upward. Yes, occasionally uh, they have parents who have gone to college, and occasionally uh, that parent or those parents instill a great deal of ambition, and uh, they say to the kid, in effect, you can make it. But so many of our poor kids are trapped and unless we understand that that is one major barrier to social mobility, we are not going to be able to come up with any policies at all that countervail. I don't think that this is a great time for talented or so-called talented poor kids uh, to live. I don't know where those talented poor kids are. They can't get into the University of California, Berkeley. They can't afford to get into the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and particularly lower middle class kids uh, from schools that are subpar because their communities don't have the tax bases uh, to generate those quality schools, uh, they are not even going to qualify uh, for good colleges and universities. Sure. Upward mobility in America is becoming more of a mythology than a reality. Uh, and as, one final point, as the income ladder gets longer and longer and longer, even if we had the same speed of upward mobility as we had 40 or 50 years ago, which we don't. But as that ladder gets longer and longer, even if we had that same speed, you couldn't go as far up the ladder. And if you have the middle rungs of the ladder missing because you no longer have those good unionized jobs that are available to people that didn't go to college, 
then it becomes even harder to move up the ladder. So we've got to understand that we are losing upward mobility in America. And, and now Charles is at the edge of his seat. Charles, man. I'm just looking out at this audience and saying, yes, IQ doesn't mean anything. And I'm asking, does that parse with your own experience, folks? Uh, look, there, I, I, I co-authored a book called The Bell Curve uh, 18 years ago, which is still a really good source for getting documentation on the issues that Bob just raised. Just a quick statement. Um, actually, I sent my kids to a mediocre school in a working class slash middle class community and you go to the awards assembly at the end of the year with the graduating seniors. And, and I assure you that the academically talented kids in that class uh, had scholarships uh, from unbelievable variety of sources. You can get an absolutely free ride, and I bet there are a bunch of people in this room who know what I'm talking about, if you exhibit that talent. And furthermore, from the Coleman Report in 1966 onward, one of the astonishing findings of social science is what a tiny proportion of academic achievement is explained by the quality of the school. So, Bill Gawson, uh, from your perspective, how much is this still a meritocracy? Well, first of all, I'd pay money to be in the audience for a debate on the impact of education between Charles Murray and Condoleezza Rice. Uh, <laughs> you know, so put those, you know, put Charles's statement together with what you heard from Condi Rice last night, and uh, you know, you have the makings of a really, really important, important policy debate. Uh, a few points. Uh, number one, uh, it is incontestable that what Americans have said to themselves for generations, namely, we may be more unequal than Europe, but we're also more mobile than Europe, and it cancels out, is simply not true. It's not true now, and scholars suspect that it wasn't nearly as true as we thought it was even, even 30 years ago. So that's, that's point number one. Social mobility in the United States is not impressive by international standards. I can prove that, and these are, o these are OECD figures. So that's, that's point number one. Point number two, I do agree with Charles, and indeed he articulated in conservative garb a left-wing argument. Left-wing sociologists call it the reproduction of advantage, and it's a real phenomenon. There's no, there's no question about it. Uh, I will now ste steal a page from David's comic sociology. If you want to do real sociological research in the United States, go to the style section of the New York Times every Sunday. Go to the back pages with the marriages. <coughs> okay? Those of us, we in Washington call it the mergers and acquisitions section. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and what you'll see is absolutely true. It's what the sociologists call a sort of mating. My colleague at Brookings, Bell saw Is it S O R D I D? Or yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my colleague at my, my colleague at Brookings, Bell Sawhill, puts it this way: You know, 40 years ago, the guys married their secretaries, and now they marry the wom the woman they met in med school or business school. I mean, that's the way it works, and. You know, so these differences build on themselves. Now, an argument in the other direction. Immigration, right? The great disruptor in the United States remains immigration. Uh, and it transfers constantly a pool of talented kids from less than fortunate economic circumstances, but from families that are rich in social capital and aspiration into the, Ameri into the American meritocratic professional classes. And that is one of many reasons why not only keeping the immigration gates open, but throwing them open farther, especially for young men and women from other countries who come to the United States to get good educations and then are sent unceremoniously packing by our immigration laws as soon as they get their degrees. This is ridiculous. Here, here. Bill, yeah. I want to hear uh, yeah, 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 what yeah, yeah, David has to say about this. Can I just jump in for a minute? Yeah. Um, the Pew Research, the uh, most recent Pew Research polls, yeah. shows we've been talking about really the, the gap between rich and poor, rich getting richer, poor getting poorer. Yeah. The new Pew Research seems to bear out the fact that most Americans feel 
that there's more conflict between rich and poor than there is between native and immigrant, than there is between black and white, absolutely. than there is between old and young. That's, abs that's absolutely true. And, you know, I think, you know, speaking now as a Washington policy person for just a minute, it is a national tragedy that a president, you know, from, who, from a party to which I do not belong, namely George W. Bush, who had the guts to take on, you know, comprehensive immigration reform that would have done all of these good things and, and a lot more, was not able to persuade the Senate of the United States to go along with him. We would have, be having a much better conversation in the United States, and I think both political parties would be in much better shape if our political discussion uh, were not so distorted by immigration. But let me make one final point, and then I'll shut up. And that is, it is one thing to be talking about what Bob Reich, a generation ago, presciently called uh, the succession, the secession of the successful, right? An excellent phrase you know, describing a very real phenomenon. The question, and this is my second challenge to you, this audience, particularly you know, the, the citizens of the United States in this audience, you will be successful. You already are successful. Will you secede from your society? Will you retreat into enclaves of people just like you? Or will you understand that for a complex mix of self-interest and a sense of dignity and pride in your own contributions to your society, that you must address yourself to yourselves to the kinds of problems that we've been talking about? You are in a position disproportionately to take your education, your innovation, your capacity to communicate, your network, and to turn it into a counterweight to some of the worst forces in our society. And for my soon-to-be grandson's sake, I hope you do. David Brooks. Uh, first of all, we're sermonizing. There's something I always tell um, you, you in, my, in our line of work, you get to meet a lot of really impressive young people, and I always uh, like to tell them, you know, you're 25, you're 30, you are really impressive. The life experiences you've had is more than anybody my age, anybody my age was doing at a similar age. By 40, the odds are that two-thirds of you will not be that impressive. <laughs> There's the humility. Uh, you'll, you'll fall back into some sort of normal lifestyle, which will be perfectly comfortable. It'll be fine. It just won't be a dazzling. And I, I run into this phenomenon all the time. So. Is this yeah, this is, think, about, think about that. David, this is, this, no, this is your inspirational right. speech. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can always tell which book David is working on. <laughs> <laughs> because this is his humility yeah. shtick, which is actually quite new. <laughs> um, no, it's a, it's a lesson to keep yeah, doing I new agree. things. I agree. Uh, you'll end up like us. Uh, <laughs> So, so first, a couple things. First, on mobility, I, Bill's right. We're about even with Europe at best. Two, I still think uh, it's we still have a lot of mobility. I think the the evidence is basically that the level of mobility has been basically flat, uh, and it may have gone down a little, but we still have a lot of mobility in this country. Uh, third, it's changed. So it used to be in the 1950s, it really mattered your bloodlines. Did you go back to the Mayflower or not? In 1950, uh, I believe it's true that 90% of those who applied to Harvard got in. The median verbal SAT score in 1950 at Harvard was 550. But if your father went in, you got in. And so that all changed over the next 20 years. And so even though the mobility rates may be flat, the nature of mobility has changed from the well-born to the well-educated. And so along with that has become a new style of elite. The older elite, we would never want to go back to them. They were boring. They had bad taste in clothes. Uh, they were very uh, narrow. And they were very undiverse. And mo most of us in this room could not be admitted. But they did have one thing. They did have a sense that I didn't earn this. And that, therefore, there was a greater sense of being a leader of a community, a greater sense of responsibility, and along with that, a greater character code. If you go to Princeton in the 1920s first, the college president in 1920s at the commencement speeches said, you have Satan in you, uh, which you have to fight. And he was telling rich boys at that time that they're sinful. Uh, and that was part of the code. Another part of the code, the freshman and the sophomore class would have snowball fights in the winter, back when we had winter. Uh, and the, but they didn't, uh, 
They didn't uh, <laughs> fight with snowballs. They fought with rocks. And you can go to the Princeton Library and see the photographs of the kids with their noses over here and their eyes swollen shut. And I don't necessarily recommend that as a character-building uh, activity, but that was part of the toughening up rich boys. So they would be decent public servants. And we got a lot of great public servants out of that. Mm -hmm. We now have an elite which, in part because it's true, says, I earned this. I built this. Uh, and I would say there has been less of a sense of serving institutions. And to me, one of the great paradoxes of the age is we've la made life fair and more open and more diverse and much more interesting. But would we necessarily say the institutions of society are working better than they were 50 years ago? Would we say that Wall Street is working better? Would we say that government is working better? Would we say that the media is working better? I don't think we would necessarily say that. And to me, the great paradox is that the promise of the meritocracy has not been fulfilled because the leadership class uh, has screwed up in fundamental ways. This whole debate uh, recently on, on my radio program, I'm wondering if this is, to use Charles Murray's language, what you talk of as a cognitive elite. Are they more selfish? Are they more self-centered, more maybe narcissistic then? Well, uh, you know, they're, they're certainly a large element of social concern. If you drive down the street here, you go to Marin County, you go to... You know, these progressive grocery stores where all the cashiers look like they're on loan from Amnesty International. Uh, and so there's a lot of community service uh, that's been do done. And that, I think, it is, um, that's all commendable. What I don't think there is is a sense of, well, I'll just stick to my community, to Washington, D.C. Uh, well, let me borrow Charles' word, seemliness. Charles has used this word in the past. Certain things you just don't do. And so I would say some of the CEO salaries violate seamliness. Mm -hmm. I would say some of the size of homes around the country violate that. <coughs> and I would say uh, going from a Senate staffer job to a million dollar lobbying job and back and forth, some of that violates it. And so I do think there's been a less, the, the code of what is socially unacceptable has been loosened significantly and always in the direction of self-indulgence. Bob Wright. I, I agree with that, but I'm not sure uh, that it's because uh, our, the composition of our elites has changed to a, a greater degree of, of meritocracy. I think it's uh, largely because uh, in the 1950s, 60s, uh, right through the early 70s, uh, most Americans had a very clear memory of social solidarity required by the Depression and World War II. Uh, we, those were two great leveling experiences. And we came out of the Depression in World War II, uh, and it was unseemly uh, for a CEO to earn more than 30 times what the average worker earned. It was unseemly uh, for people to put on displays of conspicuous consumption. It was unseemly to turn your back on your communities. Uh, but by the 70s and 1980s and 90s, uh, a lot of America had forgotten those experiences that tied us together. Uh, I think the big difference in the elites today is that we don't remember, we don't recall our mutual responsibilities as members of the same society. It may be time, and I think it is time, roughly, to, there are a lot of other things to explore here, and I, this has been really great grist for the mill, but I know there are many of you who have questions and your own thoughts and your own reflections and perhaps your own feelings that you want to bring into the mix here. So. We have four roving microphones here, and we would like this to move into interactive. Uh, just raise your hand. We'll come to you, and please become part of this conversation. And you can address questions specifically to individual panelists or just bring up whatever's on your mind. So, hi. Uh, so I heard you've been talking about a lot of things that's uh, broken. So can you give me an example of uh, invention in either in policies or program or institution in history of the United States or any country that you think it's working well and what did you learn from that and what can we learn from that? Just a single example that you think has worked the best. All right. Um, I, I'm going to give you um, a policy or at least a, a program and I guarantee you every time I say this people's eyes glaze over because it's the most boring title you could ever give a program, uh, and yet uh, it's a terribly important program. It was actually first suggested by Milton Friedman, a conservative economist, is the earned income tax credit. Uh, it's a reverse income tax, a wage subsidy, uh, now the largest anti-poverty program in the United States, 
for working people. You've got to be working in order to get the wage subsidy, uh, but it has worked uh, remarkably well. It's not perfect, needs to be improved, uh, but it's there and it needs to be, in my view, expanded. And thank you for the question. We have other questions or comments. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Alex Hughes from Berkeley Bioengineering, so I'm a 2013 Siebel Scholar and I've really enjoyed the discussion. And I have a couple, um, I think, interesting points to bring up, but I'll just stick to one. And it's one thing that hasn't been brought up yet um, so far in the discussion is what um, the effect of imprisonment in the United States brings to social mobility um, or particularly in reinforcing the, the, the poor class or the bottom kind of element of um, this layer cake that we're discussing. Uh, we have the, the highest rate of imprisonment. How does that um, come into play and how are we going to change that? David Brooks. I, I actually, I feel like you two gentlemen or you three will know more than I do about this. I haven't studied the extent to which imprisonment has impacted social mobility. I don't know. Well, who wants to take it, Bill or well, Charles or Robert? Look, I mean, let's you know, let me just state the obvious, and I'll do it. I'll do it within Charles' framework. Uh, if you know, if you're a young woman and marriage is on your mind, uh, then if your you know, if your male counterpart is in prison, <laughs> right? What does that do for the prospects of marriage? And when that person gets out and finds it almost impossible to get a, a steady job, uh, then will you, as a young woman who wants to live decently in her community, see that person as marriageable? The answer is overwhelmingly no. So there is a, you know, there is a cycle of mutual reinforcement, uh, in my language, where the, you know, you know, the, the collapse of the manufacturing sector in many cities you know, reduced, reduced the life prospects of many young men in particular who turned to illegal activities, who were then incarcerated if they survived five years of involvement in those illegal activities, and then when they got out uh, were not marriageable, uh, and the young women uh, don't want to go through life without children, they have children without benefit of marriage, without benefit of a man in the home. Uh, that generates a cycle of not only economic disadvantage, but also a parenting deficit that then feeds into all of the things that we've been talking about, uh, talking about on this panel. I think it's a huge problem, but stopping sending people to jail if they've committed serious crimes is not the way to solve that problem, in my judgment. And this was, you know, this was a nettle that you know, Bill Clinton grasped quite firmly in the 1990s. Uh, that now we can have an interesting argument about nonviolent crimes. Did well, we go? Did we go overboard on crack cocaine? You bet we did. There's also a big argument about whether or not uh, incarcerated prisoners can be trained and rehabilitated as opposed to being punished, and that argument continues to go on, and it has a lot, to, a lot of bearing on what we're talking about. Because many of these are fathers and mothers of children who are now without economic means. All of that's true, but of course. Of course, the correlation between dropping out of high school and ending up in prison is sky high. And if you dropped out of high school, even if you don't end up in prison, you know, the odds that you're going to make it in today's society are very, very small. Does it follow that if you give people a GED, you know, as part of their training before they get out of prison, that that's going to make a big difference? The numbers I read say no, it won't. Just also, so it's very, say. very difficult for somebody to get a job if they have a prison record. That too. Employers do not hire them unless unemployment gets down to below 4%, and we're not going to see that anytime soon. Uh, the other issue is that the United States does incarcerate almost 2% of our population, but this is an issue that has to do with race, class, and ethnicity. We incarcerate, if you look at black males in the United States, 23% of them have spent some of their life in prison. Uh, now here are five middle-aged or late middle-aged white men. Old, uh, old, old. It's a couple. Of <laughs> <laughs> no, except, no, no, except no, no. for Charles. I, 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 I don't, will not include Charles. Not for the first time. Uh, I'm on the uh, side. <laughs> uh, and it, it, you know, one of the realizations, one of the things that America, hopefully, is understanding as we debate this great question of who is getting what and do we have really a a problem with regard to class, uh, is we're revisiting again 
uh, we, re we are revisiting uh, the issue of race, ethnicity, uh, and its relationship to class. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's terribly closely related. Charles Murray, Just 20, 20 seconds. Uh, po point number one, crime, which was a huge issue in the 70s and 80s and because it was such a terrible problem, is not even on the horizon as an issue now. B, the people who will be victimized if we radically reduce imprisonment are not us. People who will be victimized if we radically reduce imprisonment will be people in working class, lower class communities. And so I'm not saying we aren't imprisoning too many people. I think when drug, that, that we have way too many people in prison, but any policy changes we make must not jeopardize people who are living in poor communities who are trying to do everything right. And Charles is right, though. Just demographically, crime has gone down, particularly violent crime. Let's get some of you in the back there because uh, we've been a little bit uh, concentrated. At least the first two questions came right from the front here. Could somebody in the back uh, raise your hand if you want to join the conversation or have a question? Over there. There's a microphone left. So, so one thing that seems to have been missing is in the last 30 years, there hasn't been a mandatory service or a draft. So how, what role does a draft or mandatory military service play in some of the social concerns that we've talked about? I, I feel pretty strongly about this one uh, because it's always brought up. And if we have another world war, we'll have a real, uh, r real progress in mixing uh, classes again. <laughs> but short of that, uh, the, the, the uh, draft, we don't have a big enough armed forces to have that make much difference. And universal service will be a disaster. Uh, because most of the young people who have to do it won't want to do it. And unlike the Army, the administrators of this compulsory program will not have the Uniform Code of Military Justice to back up uh, their demands. We will end up with uh, programs like the one I was in, Peace Corps, where we were all volunteers going in, but it was still kind of make work. And we will, it will be like the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act of the early 1970s when we created literally millions of jobs for low-income, disadvantaged kids. And what did we teach them? We taught them how to game the system. We, we, they weren't real jobs. We taught them how here's what you do in order to qualify for the paycheck without really working. And you will have the majority of people going into uniform, uh, going into a compulsory uh, public service, gaming the system. I think it will create more hostility and more separation rather than more unity. Charles, excuse me. I, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. I want to just, <laughs> you're talking I'm not only about prescription like here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're talking about required community service. Re re required, required service period. Okay, yeah, Bill Galston. Well, David. F.U. Alphonse. No, no, no. <laughs> I've been talking too much, David, you first. <laughs> well, nobody's talking about universal yeah. service or a draft. People are talking about, and there's been legislation, there was a piece of McCain by legislation uh, several years ago to make service a rite of passage, to make it voluntary. You get certain rewards, for scholarships and things like that, and you might do 18 months serving in a non-combat, really non-military support role. You might go into a city, do a city year type thing. You might do a Peace Corps type thing. And one of the things it would do, as it is done in Israel and Switzerland and other places where I grant that it's universal, is it would mix social groups. You would find yourself living in a dormitory with people completely unlike yourself, which never happens now. And so that by itself would be a social good. The second social good, and again, along with the Peace Corps, I'm never sure how much actual good these programs do to other people, but I've, I've never met somebody who went through these things who didn't say it did, had made a tremendous impact on their own lives. And if you're living in a society where Teach for America, for example, has to turn away 90 or 80 percent of the kids who are applying for it, it seems to me there's a huge demand for that, and it would create much more social mixing than anything else we could probably realistically do. Mm -hmm. Bill Galson. Uh, first, a piece of autobiography. In February of 1969, I was drafted out of graduate school at the University of Chicago into the U.S. Marine Corps. And did I want to go? Hell no, right? <laughs> you know, was it a bad thing that I was forced to? Hell no. So I am unimpressed with the argument that initial willingness to serve the current form code of military justice. <laughs> but the Marines, you had to do what they told you to do. Well, but, but Charles, then now let me get to point two. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's forget about civilian service for a minute. Okay, and I grant entirely that absent a world war, we won't need a nationwide mobilization. How about a lottery? 
right, where everybody at the age of 18 or everybody who graduates out of high school is equally exposed to the chance of being called to serve in the numbers that are required for the military that we now require to do its job. What's wrong with that? As things now stand, people who go to elite universities are unbelievably unlikely to engage in military service. That is bad for the country. And by the way, you can't make me believe that those talented young people couldn't make a real contribution to the U.S. military. So I reject the proposition that the all-volunteer armed forces as a, you know, as a moral or it represents the right moral and civic model for this country. I simply reject I'm that. I'm sympathetic to that. Argument. All right. Robert Wright. Well, I, I just think that there is a distinction that needs to be drawn between compulsion and social expectation. Uh, and Charles, you of all people understand the difference because we can in our society uh, create uh, an expectation that people should be uh, mm -hmm. devoting a year or two of their lives uh, to the improvement of society. Uh, it has a lot of virtues and those of us who live through uh, Vietnam understand one of the virtues that hasn't been mentioned uh, is that when society, uh, a, a large number of people in the elite have their children uh, possibly in harm's way, uh, they don't. They don't. They take war much more seriously. Amen. Uh, it's not quite as antiseptic as it would be if you can just assign war uh, to those kids who are uh, at the bottom of the economic stratum. In, in 1968, I was inducted at the Oakland Induction Center. Uh, I studied whether I was going to actually be qualified because I was an inch, I thought, too short uh, for being inducted, uh, and I was actually delighted. First time in my life, I was ever delighted to be too short for anything. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I showed up and the examining sergeant, his eyes grew wide and he saw me and he said, aha, a tunnel rat. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what's a tunnel rat? He said, well, you are the perfect size to flush the Viet Cong out from under the rice paddies with hand grenades. <laughs> And? In the end, I was not drafted, but I was tempted by the public service that it would imply. <laughs> <laughs> let's, go, let's go to the back again and then to the middle. Yeah. Three. Uh, Jeffrey Dietrich, uh, Berkeley Bioengineering. Uh, I think this is a question we can start with, Robert Reich. You've spoken many times about unions, not as much today. But if we look specifically to some of the topics that have come up, which include education, uh, prisons, uh, public transportation did not come up, but it has a huge impact upon the lower class. These are public sectors and services that are highly unionized, and unions would appear, one would, could argue, are a large part of the problem and have too much power in, in these services that most certainly impact uh, the lowest classes. I just wondered your comments on that. Uh, well, well, I, I brought that up because I'd like to hear what the former Secretary of Labor has to say. Yeah, I think, to, uh, first of all, you've got to distinguish between public sector unions, which are under a completely different set of laws uh, than private sector unions. Uh, in the private sector, we're now down to unionization that is uh, really under about 7% uh, of the workforce, uh, meaning that uh, typical workers don't have bargaining leverage to get a share of the profits and productivity improvements that they got in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, so in the, public, in the private sector, I wouldn't say uh, unionization is a problem. I think lack of unionization uh, is directly related to what we have witnessed with regard to a declining share of the productivity gains uh, that the workforce actually gets. Uh, with regard to public sector unions, I, I think that uh, you find public sector unions that are, with regard to their members, if you talk about the level of education of the typical public sector union worker relative to the level of education of the private sector worker doing corresponding things, uh, they're receiving about the same compensation. The difference, particularly in places like California, has to do with the benefits, particularly pension benefits. Uh, and that does need to be reformed. Bob, there's been, you know, quite a uh, blowback in places like Wisconsin because of those pension benefits and because feeling that uh, cities are in serious danger and they can't sustain the kind of budgetary crisis they're in. So this kind of recoiling, does it, does it, do you see it in the whole picture of class warfare? Uh? Well, Wisconsin is a special case because, as you know, the governor exempted 
attacked the police and the fire fighting unions because they supported his governorship. Uh, you know, a lot of Republicans don't like public sector unions because they are overwhelmingly democratic. Uh, I think the teachers unions, uh, you know, are um, are now being uh, vilified. Uh, I think uh, it's 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 probably inappropriate. Uh, most of the teachers I know are very dedicated people, but I do think that we've got to uh, reward teachers who do a good job and get rid of teachers who are not doing a good job. So I think that aspect of teacher pay and performance has got to be linked. Uh, but if we want talented people to go into teaching, uh, we have got to uh, pay them enough. Uh, the law of supply and demand is not repealed at the schoolhouse door. I mean, the typical teacher is earning about $60,000. Uh, that may sound like a lot, uh, but the teacher is the custodian of our future uh, relative to the typical hedge fund manager who is earning a thousand times more and is the custodian of what? A rhetorical question. Um, you know, somebody said to me, I, uh, somebody's on the next panel this afternoon, uh, I, you can guess who it might have been, said, where was the talk about corporations on the panel? And why wasn't there talk about the minimum wage and so forth? And it might be a good time to bring that in in terms of talking about unions as well. How much do corporations have to do what Gore Vidal used to call the corporate oligarchy or, for that matter, Citizens United and the Supreme Court decision which allows them to be individuals? How much does that have to do with really the systemic problems that we're talking about. Well, okay, I'll be the sucker. Uh, <laughs> I know, uh, I, I would be happy to go, but I'm not going because I've, I've been occupying. Come back. Okay. Uh, <laughs> look, uh, we had a very large corporate sector in the United States in the 1950s, but we were not having this same discussion in the 1950s. And the question is, why not? And my answer to that question, and I've stated it before, so I'll keep it brief now, is that US corporations lived in an insulated paradise in the 1950s. You know, the, the rest of the world's economy, for the most part, had been destroyed, or at least flattened, uh, in World War II. It was still rebuilding. We had no major competitors in that period, and therefore we could administer an internal economy, you know, which stood on some sort of corporatist equilibrium, labor, corporate management, and the, pub the public sector. The fundamental transformation in my lifetime is the end of an insulated America and the rise of an increasingly comprehensive globalized economy that ended up, starting roughly 40 years ago, putting increasing pressure on that insulated economy. And that did have an effect on corporate policy. There's no question about it. You know, a consensual relationship between management and labor you know, strikes that were sort of like kabuki plays in the 1950s and 1960s turned into the real thing. Uh, managers began to believe, and I think with some justice, that they couldn't continue relations with their workforces the way they had in, in roughly the 25 years after the end of the Second World War and still make it in this new economy. The United States is still grappling with the consequences of that great transformation between economic insulation to economic globalization. And quite frankly, we've had decades to think the problem through, and we haven't done a very good job of making progress on it. And this conversation that we're having today is in part a result of that failure, in my opinion. Mm. I know, Bob, you're chomping at the bit. Let's, let's hear maybe from uh, David or Charles first. I don't have anything useful to say. <laughs> David? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, corporations do what um, their incentives tell them to do. Uh, and I, I really think globalization was important, but I, I definitely think it was technological change. If you look at manufacturing output, output in this country, manufacturing, manufacturing output over the last 20 years is like this. We've been actually increasing. We're not, we're not losing manufacturing output. Jobs are like this. And if you're working at a steel plant, sure, you're facing Japanese steel competition. You're also facing competition from across the street. And so... You know, they're going to, they're going to, if you go to a factory now, it's extremely quiet. There's nobody there. 
Uh, and I think that would have happened without globalization. I'm not sure it's wrong to blame corporations for that. That was just the nature of technological change. And it, it was how whether people had the uh, both the social uh, and community support to adapt to that change, that's the real problem. Is outsourcing or creating uh, companies that don't that, that get tax havens outside of the country or outside of the state, well, is that all a part of also the same well, process? First, yeah. I think the tax haven issue is trivial. Uh, as for what, how much of it is technology and how much of it is outsourcing, my understanding of the economic consensus such as it exists is that in the past it's mostly technology, but there is some debate over whether the future that will continue to be true. There's a guy, Alan Blinder at Princeton, who argues that in the future the outsourcing will be much more painful to people as, di as more services face international competition. If I could just for one minute... David and I appear to be disagreeing, but in fact we're not. <laughs> and here's why. Uh, in my view, we have to ask why there has been such a drive in the past generation to substitute technology for labor whenever possible. The answer to that question, I believe, is global competition. So there is a relation. I absolutely agree with you when you, when you, when you do the economic analysis and try to break out the different factors that are driving the problem that we're talking about. What jumps out at you is technology. But when you ask why this incredible substitution, take a look at steel plants, you know, where the labor intensity is about a tenth of what it was a generation ago, the answer is competition from all over the world that forced corporate managers to do that. They had to do more with less labor, and that's why we have output going in one direction in the manufacturing sector and labor input going in the opposite direction. So th this is part of the same phenomenon. Well, we'll hear now from Robert Rice, and we'll go to more of your questions. Rob? Yeah, I think globalization and technology, as I said before, are certainly critical, and we can debate which is the chicken and which is the egg. But I do think there's also been a breakdown in the social contract in the United States. Uh, whereas in the 1950s, 60s, and early 1970s, uh, the typical CEO understood that he, usually a he, rarely a she, had responsibilities not only to shareholders, but also to workers, uh, the community, uh, other constituents. Uh, and that was part of the corporate creed. Uh, it was not just a mission statement that was given lip service to, but it was something that corporations lived. Uh, now we have CEOs who instead of earning 30 times the typical labor, uh, typical uh, worker, are earning 300 times. Uh, and there is no sense of responsibility to anybody other than the shareholder. Uh, it's hard to blame anybody. I don't want to blame corporations because I don't blame uh, institutions that are not people, except the Supreme Court and Mitt Romney think corporations are people, so maybe they ought to be blamed. But I do think uh, that Wall Street also uh, and uh, the entire financial community uh, bears part of the responsibility here because the relentless, since the 1980s, the relentless drive for short-term uh, performance uh, by Wall Street and that pressure on companies has made it very difficult for companies to pay any attention to any goal or any constituent other than shareholders and also other than very short-term performance with regard to shareholders uh, to the detriment of, I think, a lot of the other constituents and communities that corporations used to pay attention to. Can I just make a quick point about uh, 30 seconds dueling uh, nostalgias? So on the left, people tend to be nostalgic for the economics of the 1950s. On the right, we're more nostalgic for the, the family structures of the 1950s. And it's probably true that both of us are deluded to think we're going to go back to either of those things. <laughs> You're absolutely right. <laughs> um, go in the middle here. Could we get uh, some of the microphones uh, for people who are raising their hands around in the middle? Either. Yeah. Um, Sumi Kim from Stanford GSB. Uh, I wanted to return to the question of education, mobility, um, and an element of class and inequality that struck me as missing from the discussion. Um, so Charles Murray, you talk about how now is the best time to be academically talented and poor. You will get discovered. And David Brooks, you said that things are fairer now than they have been before. But I would argue in both those cases, you seem to be referring to what I would call academically elite poor people. So yes, if you're incredibly talented and you're poor, you probably have a decent chance of getting discovered by Harvard or Princeton. And to me, that doesn't really strike me as the problem. What strikes me as the problem is the bottom, say, 20, 30 percent, where they're decent. They're probably not bright enough to go to Harvard, but they would be bright enough to go to a decent uh, higher educational institution if they came from a place with decent means. And I think that is sort of the chunk of 
poor people who get lost in the education and mobility uh, discussion. It's not the super bright poor people who get lost. It's the kind of average, um, averagely intelligent poor people who get lost. And those are the people where if you come from a poor background, you really don't have that great of a shot of going to an institute of high, institution of higher education compared to someone of equal talent but from a much uh, higher income class. You know, I, I, Charles Murray, I'd like to get your response to this because I think we're at a time now where you see a lot of young people who do go to these elite institutions who do perform well, but they're in liberal arts and there are just not jobs for them in the liberal, with a degree. You were talking about the useless piece of paper. Yeah, but I, I'm going to stick with, with specifically with the issue that, that was raised by the questioner. Um, and I think it, it goes to the dysfunction of the higher educational system. You said something about the bottom 20 or 30 percent who could go to a decent college. Well, actually, if you talk about a traditional college education, the textbooks you have to be able to read and so forth and so on, uh, I can supply documentation as I have in a book called Real Ed Education that, that maybe uh, 15 to 20 percent of the entire population of 18-year-olds belong in four-year college, traditionally, uh, traditionally uh, defined. On the other hand, almost all kids need some kind of training post high school to get jobs. And suppose that we got rid of the idea of a four-year residential education leading to a BA as the trajectory after high school. That w the amount of time you spent would depend on what <coughs> you wanted to do. If you wanted to uh, go into business, uh, you take three courses in marketing and two in accounting and two in business management or something like that. You're done in a year and a half and you have a certification test that you can take to an employer that uh, tells the employer what you know, not where you learned it and how long it took you. That kind of approach to uh, post-secondary education can apply across the board to, to kids of all levels of ability with different kinds of skills that they can acquire to make a living. The Insofar as we continue to say everybody should go to college, uh, having a BA is the measure of educational success, what you are doing are taking kids in that bottom half, and it's not, the, the real problem are the kids who are trying desperately hard to get into those schools, taking out college loans to do it, and the rest of it dropping out of school because it's not really for them, never was for them. They're saddled at age 19 or 20 with uh, $100,000 in debt reform of post high school education is one of the most useful things we can do and it is that which will address the, the question of opportunity for the young people that you're concerned about. This is already going on. I mean at Stanford and many other universities they have programs where they don't offer a baccalaureate degree, they just offer training. But Stanford? <laughs> yeah, Stanford. Well, they're uh, not the, Stanford's not the problem. I mean if you go to Stanford, you know, I, I bet 97% of the kids at Stanford complete college. Uh, or any, you know, elite schools, you got... No, the program is being run by oh, I people see. in, in okay. computer. But that, that gets right. me to the point that I, that, I, that I was really like to hear you talk about, David, and that is during the Occupy movement, you'd see these kids who, as Charles indicated, was terribly saddled in debt. They had degrees from elite universities. They had degrees in my field, the humanities, in many instances, philosophy, literature, uh, history, and there were no jobs for them. I mean, uh, the fact of the matter is many of their college roommates who are also in debt could get jobs there in fields like many of you are in, computer science, bioengineering, these are field business, these are fields where there are job openings. But now we have a different system now. You can get to a college education at Harvard and major in philosophy, there's not a job for you. Well, you know, I was a history major. And I, um, and, you know, I like to flatter myself that, you know, I could have gone into, you know, Wall Street and made a lot of money. Uh, but the fact is I, stu I suck at math, so I never could have done that. Uh, so some of us just don't have choices. Uh, I guess the thing I'd say is that if, uh, <laughs> and uh, I thought I'd wind up in an airline magazine, uh, <laughs> but the, you know, the kids who go to um, sort of the top 20% of schools who are history and English majors, I suspect most of them are doing fine. The unemployment rate for college educated people is 4%. So they're probably doing fine. I mean, we, our, my story, my newspaper did during the Occupy movement did a profile of a, a young man who was in Occupy, and he, he majored in puppeteering, and he couldn't get a job puppeteering. Uh, well, <laughs> you make your choices. You, you take the <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, 
Uh, my my Did problem. Did you do a life in politics? <laughs> well, you know, you live with, you know, you, you get a cool nature, but uh, fine. Uh, my problem is, is, back to the question is, and I think it dovetails with Charles's answer, is that in most schools, you go to colleges where 9% get a degree, 20% get a degree, where the dropout rates are astronomical. And why are they dropping out? The first reason they're academically unprepared. They just can't write a college essay. Uh, the second reason are things like bad stuff happens at home and life gets complicated. Third reason, financial. And fourth, they're just emotionally disengaged. And the crucial question to Charles's policy idea is, could we make it so more of those kids complete the four-year, or should we admit they're never going to complete the four-year and we should go to what Charles describes? We'll go again to the audience. Another question or comment from any of you. Please feel free. Hi, Amy Chen from Stanford GSB. Given the magnitude of the questions we've been talking about, I'm curious how optimistic each of you are about the prospects of achieving a more equal America. And if you had one or two thoughts on what the path forward looks like, what would that be? Bill, want to begin? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, for a very long time, people have gone broke betting against the United States of America. And, you know, in my dark moments, I console myself with Winston Churchill's dictum that you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted all the alternatives. Well, <laughs> you know, and, you know, and the good news is that I believe that we have exhausted all of the alternatives. And I, you know, and I'm encouraged, as I said before, by the fact that leaders of the private sector who've been disengaged from many of these debates for a long time are getting re-engaged and are getting organized in that, in that re-engagement. I think, I think that's a good sign. I also think that there is a pervasive sense in the country that enough is enough, right? That we've been arguing, we've been arguing and posturing for a very long time we have not been a prob in a problem-solving mode as a society for a very long time. I think, we, I think if we cross the threshold you know, from a politics of mutual blame to a politics of problem-solving, uh, that there is no limit to what we can do as, as a country. Let me give you just one example. This is a pretty politically diverse panel. Uh, but there is a lot of agreement that I've heard on a very important point, and that is that we need to rethink not college education in this country, but post-secondary education in this country, that whether you're looking at the German model or American community colleges or new relationships between Stanford and communities or new relationships between corporations and educational institutions like high schools, there is an enormous amount of good that can be done for many of the people that Charles has been talking about and has been writing about if we can figure out how to equip young people with the sorts of skills for which there is a market and for which there will be a market uh, in, the, in the decades to come. This is not an insoluble problem. On that important it. note of doing good and yeah. finding ways to do good, um, I hope we've done a lot of good here this morning. We have another panel this afternoon, and it's my job now to uh, unfortunately, um, well, maybe fortunately, unfortunately bring this panel to, an, to a close because uh, we're going to break for lunch at the uh, Campanella Esplanade.